a Bible, just put your hand up, and these guys will make sure that you get one. So put your hand up high. Don't let them pass you by if you need one. And let's take our Bibles and open up to Titus chapter 3. Titus chapter 3. From my guesstimation, counting today, we have three messages left in Titus, and then we're done. So if you, some of you are laughing. Why? Like I would drag it on unnecessarily. Um, but today in two more Sundays. I want you to imagine with me, we'll be in verses uh, 9 to 11 this morning in chapter 3. I want you to imagine with me for a moment here what it would be like if every time you or any of your family members stepped outside of your home, that somehow you knew they were going to be threatened physically or emotionally or spiritually. If if you knew that your kids were going to be intimidated or harassed at school, or if you knew that you were going to work and were going to be intimidated or harassed anywhere you went outside your home, that would be difficult. And no matter how much you might want to remove those kinds of threats that are outside of your home against you or your family members, you can't neutralize all of them, maybe any of them. What you can do simply, though, is fortify and train yourself and train your family to stand securely in the face of those kinds of threats. And in that kind of a situation, what a joy it is to come home when your home is a refuge, right? You come to your home and you are finding a place of peace there with others who are with you in your home. But then I want you to imagine what it would be like to come into your household one day to find out that someone was in your home posing a threat to your family in your refuge. Your peace as a family, your unity is now threatened within your home. Maybe there are some lies being circulated within your family that make your family members look on one another with suspicion. Or imagine coming home to find that your family has become divided against itself, against you. Those threats in your own household are different than the threats you face outside of your home. Outside of your home, you can't eliminate all of the threats. But inside your home, you must root out those threats to your family, those that threaten your family's way of life together. And we could say, Welcome to the church with such an illustration. You see, outside of our church family, out there in the world that we live in, we all face threats that are beyond our control, that are beyond our regulation. We can't remove them. The most that we can do is fortify ourselves to stand securely in the gospel and in the word of God in the face of those threats. But from time to time as a church family, we will face threats and have faced threats that arise from within. And elders are called in chapter 1, verse 7 of this book, God's stewards. That means God's household managers, in a sense. This is God's household. The the local church is God's household. And as elders who are given the weighty responsibility to manage the oversight of God's household of faith, the elders are called to remove those inner threats in order to secure all that is good and all that is profitable that God has intended for the body of Christ, the church. And our passage this morning contains two inseparable threats that come up within the church that must be removed by the elders of the church because God has good things for us. He has profitable things for us in the church. And those good and profitable things must be attainable at all costs. And in our passage, just as a reminder, he is writing to Titus. And so these are direct words for Titus as Titus strengthens the churches on the island of Crete in the first century. Titus is the one who is called on by Paul here to to remove these two threats from the churches. But remember, Titus has a limited amount of time on the island of Crete. If you look down in verse 12 of chapter 3, 
Paul says, when I send Artemis or Tychicus to you, make every effort to come to me at Nicopolis, for I have decided to spend the winter there. So the winter of that year is coming, and Titus will be leaving by that time. And so that is the one that Paul is giving direct um, instruction and command to. But certainly Paul does not intend that once Titus leaves the island, that no one else in the church is able to remove the threats from within the church because only Titus was supposed to do that. That would be foolish, and that's not Paul's intent. Titus is functioning as an elder alongside the elders of the churches in, on the island of Crete. And so elders are to protect the church from these kinds of inner family threats whenever they arise. So what is this passage all about? I'll put it for you up on the screen. You can see it. It's this, two inseparable threats within the church must be removed by the elders to secure what is good and profitable for the church. Let me read it to you and then we'll pray. But avoid foolish controversies and genealogies and strife and disputes about the law, for they are unprofitable and worthless. Reject a factious man after a first and second warning, knowing that such a man is perverted and is sinning, being self-condemned. Let's pray. Now, Father, these are very sobering words just like it would be a very sobering day to have to remove somebody from within our own household because of the damage that was being caused. That's what is happening here in the local church. And so, Lord, we pray that you would give us um, a humble heart, a teachable heart. Help us to see that for us here you have safety, you have protection for us. We pray, Lord, for the elders of this church and the elders of churches across this valley, Lord, that they would take their job seriously, that, Lord, elders would hold fast the faithful word, that they would be able both to exhort with sound doctrine and to refute those who contradict so that the church, which is the bride of your son, the precious body of Christ, so that it would have unity and so that it would reach the godly living that you desire it to have, Lord. Accomplish this in our church family. Help us to walk humbly under your word even now and before each other. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so there are two threats within the church that must be removed. The first one is fruitless messages, verse 9. And before we unpack this first threat, we need to understand the connection of verses 9 to 11 and the prior paragraph because they're related in a very important way. Look at verse 8. Do you see how it ends? These things are good and profitable. Those are everything that has been said in verse 8. Paul told Titus, this is a trustworthy statement, and that refers to verses 4 to 7, which is, this is how God saves sinners, and this is a reliable, trustworthy message. Hold on to this. And concerning these things, verse 8, Paul says, I want you to speak confidently as an elder, as a leader, so that those who have believed God will be careful to engage in good deeds. You see, out of how God saves a sinner, out of that is to be a, an elder or a body of elders saying, this is how we must live as believers. Speak confidently of how we should live so that they will be careful to engage in good deeds. These things, this exhortation to godliness in the church that comes from elders, that comes from the pastors, these things are good and profitable. That is the good and the profit that God has for the church, for the body of Christ. God saved us when we were just like all the other lost ones, remember? Chapter 3, verse 3. And now as believers, we're being exhorted to live godly lives everywhere we go. We're to be careful to engage in good deeds. And these things are good and profitable. But, verse 9, avoid foolish controversies, etc., because they are unprofitable and worthless. Worthless. 
They are just the opposite. They are not profitable and wor- they're, they're, they're not profitable and they're worthless toward the end that he's been talking about, which is that the church would become more and more godly. So this is a threat to the church from within the church. What is it? We'll call them fruitless messages. They're fruitless in this sense that they are unprofitable. That means there's, they have no value. They are useless. They're, they're messages that bring no advantage toward godly living. They're worthless messages. They're futile. They're empty. They're vacuous. So they are then in no way capable of helping believers achieve what is good and profitable in the church, which is good deeds, godly living. These fruitless messages are threats to what God has designed for us, and therefore they need to be removed. Well, how do you remove them? Look at verse 9. Avoid them. That verb means to go around, to go around something so as to avoid them or it. Step around them so as to avoid them. What that means is the elders are not supposed to stop and pause and give extended look and evaluation to these fruitless messages. They are not to pause before them. They're not to take a step closer toward them. They're not to investigate them to see if there might be some kind of merit somewhere in this message, as if if they were just to keep turning it over and over and over and keep turning it like a Rubik's Cube, that eventually they'll find something that makes sense. No, they are supposed to see what it is and avoid it. Elders are to be Men who hold fast the faithful words so that they'll recognize a fruitless message when it's present. An unprofitable and worthless one. And then those elders are to entirely avoid them. Well, what forms can fruitless messages come in that we must avoid in the church? And this list in verse 9 is not intended to be exhaustive as if these are the only kinds of fruitless messages in the whole world But it is what Paul and most of the churches in the first century faced repeatedly. And so first, avoid foolish controversies. The word foolish there means dull in the sense of being senseless. It's a senseless, dull, foolish controversy. And controversy means it's a speculation. It's a questioning. A foolish questioning. A a dull speculation. A senseless controversy. This is the kind of controversy or questioning that makes no sense to consider at all. It's foolish to consider it. These kinds of controversies are unprofitable and worthless toward godly living, and they must be avoided in the body. They make no contribution to godly living, and the church is only to be taught that which contributes to godly living. That's sound doctrine. That's sound teaching. Perhaps an observation will be helpful in this If a church is grounded solidly in the gospel, is grounded solidly in sound teaching, it will be easier for the elders and for the members of that body to identify which kinds of questionings and speculations and uh, and, uh, subjects are controversial and foolish and which questionings are worthwhile to consider. Well-taught churches will be able to sniff out more readily the message that is oddly out of place or that is out of sync with the clear meaning from the page of Scripture. But but a church that hasn't been taught as well concerning the gospel or hasn't been taught as well concerning sound doctrine, it, it might call some sound biblical positions controversial simply because the norm for them has been that which is not sound. So when a doctrine like election is brought up in a church like that, they might conclude that that's a foolish controversy. That only brings about controversy, and so we won't talk about that. They might say something like theology is is controversial, and so we're going to stay away from that, And, and that's actually very sad. You see, the problem is not a sound theological biblical truth like election. The problem There is the church is in such a poor condition to actually mistake sound doctrine as something which is foolishly controversial. 
And that's not what Paul is saying here. Elders must be able to detect and label what are foolish controversies, those things which are unprofitable and worthless for the church. That's why the elders have to hold fast the faithful word, chapter 1, verse 9. Fruitless messages took on the form also in Paul's day of genealogies. Do you see that in verse 9? That sounds bizarre to us. How can, can you imagine walking into church and somebody would be teaching on genealogies? Um, but in the first century where the Old Testament was all that the church had for many years. And the church was full of many Jewish believers in the early church. You could see how genealogies would gain interest quickly. Let me remind you just of a couple things. Look back at chapter 1, verse 10. Paul said, in the, on the island of Crete, in the churches, there are many rebellious men, empty talkers and deceivers, especially those of the circumcision. They are the ones who must be silenced because they're upsetting whole family, a whole families, teaching things they should not teach. So the false teachers on the island of Crete are Jewish in nature. And then in chapter 1, verse 14, they are paying attention to Jewish myths. And they need to be reproved severely so that they won't pay attention to those things. And if you'll turn over to 1 Timothy chapter 1, Paul really pulls these two ideas together very clearly. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 4, he says to Timothy, if you back up to verse 3, I urged you upon my departure for Macedonia to remain on at Ephesus so that you may instruct certain men not to teach strange doctrines, nor, watch this, to pay attention to myths and endless genealogies. And what comes out of that kind of message? Which give rise to mere speculation rather than admin, uh, furthering the administration of God or the, how the household should live. So what comes out of that kind of a message is just futile speculation. Godly living doesn't come out of that. You can go back to Titus chapter 3. So what we believe was the case in the first century was that these false teachers, they would start with a, a simple, short genealogy, and then they would quickly either leave the page and run into their own imagination, or they would dive into the space between the verses into their own imagination, and they would wander off into some kind of a mythical distortion of that character in the genealogy, and... That, according to Paul, is unprofitable. It's worthless. It doesn't bring about advantage towards godly living. More time on things like that is spent between the lines of Scripture in the imagination of men than in the words themselves on the page. Such things like that make no contribution to godly living, and the elders are not to turn it over and over and over and over again to see, well, there's got to be something positive in that somewhere. No, avoid it. Step around it for the purpose of of avoiding it. Fruitless messages also took the form of what Paul calls strife in verse 9. This is like controversies mentioned before. it. The message is given a name that reveals what it produces. It's a message that produces strife. It's a message that's marked by contention or disagreement. It's an idea or a position or a view that results in bickering and that is not to be entertained at all whatsoever. It is to have no platform in the church. And again, how well a church is grounded in the gospel and, and in sound doctrine will determine how well they can determine if um, the disagreement that a particular teaching results in is one worth engaging in or not. I'm sure you've been in a church where the, for instance, like the doctrine of election or the doctrine of total depravity caused disagreement, caused strife. So are we supposed to avoid the doctrine of election? That's not what Paul is addressing here. Elders must hold fast the faithful word so that they understand these kinds of doctrines, so that they can identify then the harmful message that's marked by strife in the body. Those, kinds of, those other kinds of messages that are marked by strife of, of that nature, were, they contribute nothing to godly living in the church. They're fruitless, and therefore they're to be avoided at all costs. And lastly, verse 9, fruitless messages also took the form of disputes about the law. The church was experiencing in Paul's day battles, quarrels 
fights about the law. And, and there was a right kind of fight to fight concerning the misuse of the law in the call of salvation in the gospel in the early church. Remember, Paul and Barnabas had to fight um, hard and long for this in Acts chapter 15 as the gospel was expanding. The law had no place as a prerequisite for salvation in the preaching of the gospel. The gospel of grace would cease to be the gospel of grace if law snuck into the preaching of the gospel. That dispute about the law is worth fighting every single time, right? But that's not what Paul's talking about in Titus chapter 3 and verse 9. The elders who were holding fast the faithful word, they would know which disputes about the law were fruitless ones and contributed to uh, nothing, to godly living. And therefore, those disputes about the law were to be removed from the church by avoiding them entirely. And again, this list is not exhaustive in any sense, um, but the list gives us ideas for how elders today should identify fruitless messages. And I want you to notice with me something really important. I want you to, to grasp this from this list. These, these messages are bad. These are bad. They're to, be, they're, they're to be avoided at all costs. They're not to be tolerated at all. But there's a message that is more damaging to the church than these. And it is the false gospel, a false gospel. Flip over to Galatians chapter 1, verse 6 for a moment. Galatians chapter 1, verse 6. This is what was happening in the Galatian church, the church in Galatia. Paul said in Galatians 1, verse 6, I'm amazed that you are so quickly deserting him who called you by the grace of Christ for a different gospel. You see, what a different gospel does is it makes you turn away from him, God, Jesus. Which really, that different gospel is not another. Only there are some who are disturbing you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to what we have preached to you, he is to be accursed. And then he repeats himself in verse 9. So a preaching of a false gospel is soul-damning doctrine that would cause a church to cease to be a church in short time. But what Paul mentions here back in Titus chapter 3, these are damaging messages, but lesser in damage than a false gospel. These are not automatically in and of themselves soul-damning, but they are sanctification-damaging. That's the point. These fruitless messages are bad because they contribute nothing to our godly living. False gospels are far worse because they actually condemn the one who entrusts his soul to it. So elders must hold fast the faithful word in such a manner to not just identify false gospels and protect the church from them, but also the elders are to be among the body and hold fast to the faithful word in such a way that they, as they listen carefully for messages in the body, they would be able to identify the ones that do not contribute towards a sanctified life and avoid those too. If the subject or the position or the view being debated between believers does not contribute to godly living, it is to be taken out, avoided, rooted out from the body. And notice that on at least two of these examples given in verse 9, that they began on a page of Scripture. Where did they get the genealogies from? Genesis. Where did they get the disputes about the law from? The Pentateuch. So at least in two of these cases, it's probable that all four of these are, all began on the pages of Scripture in the Old Testament. But what does that mean? It means that the Bible was open and something on that page of Scripture was acknowledged and considered, but very soon things went south. These messages can actually begin in the Bible, but then quickly be twisted into something damaging to the sanctification of the body. It wasn't like somebody snuck into the church and started to bring some kind of strange doctrine from Egyptian spirituality about Ra, the sun god, and the church was getting it. That's not what's going on here. These fruitless messages arise from within, get this, Christian thought. Christian thought. 
wrong Christian thought, but that's where they arise from. And elders must hold fast the faithful word so that they can both exhort with sound doctrine and refute those who contradict. And the measurement that Paul gives to the elders and to all of us as a church is this. Does that Christian-sounding message contribute to godly living? Measure it by that. Verse 8. This is a trustworthy statement. The gospel And concerning these things, I want you to speak confidently about exhorting believers to godly living. Speak confidently about that so that those who have believed in that gospel will be careful to engage in good deeds. Those are the good things and the profitable things for the church. Measure it by that. Does it achieve that? Or does that Christian-sounding message contribute nothing to godly living? Is it unprofitable and worthless? And if it is, remove it. Not every message that sounds Christian-like is worthy of a place in your small group, in the pulpit, in a Sunday school class. Only the ones that produce godly living should be there. That's what Paul is saying. Where did these fruitless messages come from? That leads to the second threat. Number two, factious messengers. Factious messengers. Verse 10, reject a factious man. A factious man is the messenger propagating the fruitless messages that must be avoided. The word factious there initially had the idea... um, as being one who chose his own view. He chooses for himself. That means his views are purely and only self-chosen. He is the only final authority on what he believes. That would mean that anything outside of him, like the authority of Scripture, doesn't play a role in his decision. He simply won't consider that which is contrary to his own view. He believes what he believes, and he won't be influenced by anything else outside of him. And the word factious does a great job of revealing what the intent of such a man like that is. What's his intent? To be factious. To bring about divisions in the body. To bring about schisms in the church. You see, he's not content to be the only guy sitting by himself down at Starbucks with his headphones on studying his own bad thinking. It's got to impact others from his viewpoint, and for him, the church is the perfect place for the factious messenger because he can play around with Christian-sounding ideas and views, and he can get believers to listen to him even though his messages have been entirely fruitless in his own life and will produce no fruit in the lives of those who hear. This factious messenger ends up dividing believers against believers, maybe dividing elders against elders, maybe dividing believers against their elders and vice versa as they propagate these fruitless messages. That kind of man in the church is a huge threat. How do you remove that threat? Verse 10, reject him. Reject him. And listen, that can't mean anything less than putting him out of the church. It can't mean anything less than that. It can't mean anything less than excommunication. You would do that if it were your own household. If someone was instructing or debating with your children or your wife in a way that distracted them from your leadership or that divided them against other family members, you'd ask them to leave. You wouldn't say, stop that, but you can still live here. What would it mean to reject that influence in your home but still allow it to be in your home? Same in the church. What would reject a factious man mean if that man is still allowed to be in the church? What kind of rejection would that be? It'd be a dangerous, it'd be a meaningless rejection. It'd be no rejection at all. So understand what Paul is instructing the church here on. 
This is not a passage about false gospels being taught by false teachers. It is a passage about fruitless messages that contribute nothing toward godly living. And those are being put forward by men who just want to divide the church against the church. Reject such messengers and avoid their messages. And obviously, you would do the very same thing with a false teacher and a false gospel. But Paul, I think, in this passage, is raising up our sensitivity levels regarding foolish, Christian-sounding messages and divisive men. He's raising our sensitivity levels for divisive men. They both are threats within the church that must be removed and avoided, Paul says. Now listen, we should have a very high sensitivity level for false gospels and false teachers, but this passage would have us raise higher the danger levels that fruitless messages bring and factious messengers pose in the body. Reject them. Do not tolerate them. Don't give them their own little corner in the church to play with their fruitless message. Reject them. How? Well, Paul says right here in verse 10, reject a factious man after a first and second warning. That would mean first, before you even get to the warning, that would mean that the elders hold fast to the faithful word in such a manner that they can actually identify the unprofitable and worthless effects of that message on the man himself and on the body, if it's had a chance to get into the body. And the elders are able to discern that there's a division arising in the body from that factious man. And so then, on the basis of that, they would go to that man and admonish him or warn him. Maybe it would sound something like, your controversy is foolish, or your dispute about fill-in-the-blank is worthless, and it does not contribute to your own godliness. Your life's a wreck. And people are being influenced by what you're saying in negative ways. And so we're instructing the body to avoid your message, and we are warning you that your message is dividing the body against one another and against the elders, away from godly living, and we're asking you now to turn away from what you have been and what you have been doing in the body. This is your first warning, to not be that kind of man and to not do this in this body. And then the elders would watch very carefully closely, and they would pursue the man and disciple him if he, would, if he would let him. They would try everything to try to get him to see his error, they would stay close to him, and they would wait. And if he does not listen to that first warning, then those elders would have to come back and say something like, you've been warned once by us, yet you continue on in your factious teaching, and this is your second and your last warning. Tell us, what are you going to do now? Just, just tell us now with this warning, what are you going to do? Will you turn and will you repent? Or are you going to continue on doing what you've been doing? And if he doesn't listen to the elders, that factious man is to be rejected and removed from the church. And again, what kind of rejection would it be if he was allowed to stay within the body? He's demonstrated himself after two warnings. He's not changing. Why would elders let that stay in the church? And notice that God's word here, have you noticed this? That it has a different time frame and approach to this man than Jesus prescribes in Matthew 18. Did you think about that? There are four steps in Matthew 18 before an unrepentant member is put out of the church. Four steps. But how many steps are in this one? Two. Why? Why the difference? Because the one who teaches or propagates an unprofitable and worthless message that will divide the church is of far greater harm to the church. And so the action plan to remove that one from Jesus' body is much more urgent and abrupt. Abrupt. 
And then notice this also about the brevity of the after a first and a second warning. Do you know what that means? And the elders could have testified to this. We've seen this. Here's the way that these kind of men are. The first debate leads to a second debate, which leads to a third debate, which leads to a fourth debate, which leads to a fifth argument, which leads to a sixth argument, then changes to this contention and the ninth contention. It just keeps going on and on and on. A factious man loves contention. That's what he's about. And so the brevity of the warnings, a first and a second, allows for time to investigate and to establish the fruitlessness of the message in his own life and in the lives of others. And then the elders are called by God in his word to end it sooner than later. The factious man in his foolish message if debated over and over and over and over again in the church, if he always has a sitting with the elders whenever he wants, the elders could unwittingly be giving to the church the impression that this is a message worth listening to. Wow, my mess. My elders are listening to this again for the ninth time. There must be something to this. You don't want to give that impression. It is fruitless, and he is factious. It is not a message worth considering. Bring it to a swifter end. Also notice this about the brevity of the after a first and a second warning. A genuine believer in the body might get caught up in some of those fruitless ideas, right? And they might even themselves become contentious or become divisive with that within the church. You know what God's instruction assures us of here? That upon giving two warnings with, with real explanation going on for what's happening, What's at stake? A genuine believer will go, I don't want to do that. I don't want to, I don't want to do that. Would you need to be told twice by your elders? What kind of man wouldn't listen after two warnings? What kind of man wouldn't listen to a group of elders saying, stop this? We're told. It's a man who's bent on disagreement and conflict. It's a man who loves his own conclusions more than he loves Christ's body. It's a man who loves getting attention through contention. It's a man who doesn't think anything about himself drifting off into ungodliness and doesn't, isn't concerned at all if others drift off into ungodliness. It's a man who enjoys watching believers be at war with one another. And if the elders follow God's instructions in verse 10, and if after a second warning that man will not change, what will the elders know? Look at verse 11. What will we all know? We will know this, that such a man is perverted and is sinning, being self-condemned. That's what we all will know. That's what God's word says. We'll know that if we follow God's instructions in verse 10. We'll know that. No one will be guessing if we follow the the directions that God gives to us. No one will be guessing. Nobody will be wondering. Nobody will be supposing. Nobody will be hoping that the elders did the right thing and hopefully this isn't an innocent man who is just the victim of mistaken identity. No, we'll know. What kind of man is it that who, who will not listen after two warnings? He's a perverted man. That means he is twisted off from the truth. He's warped in his spiritual senses. He's a distorted man. What kind of man would hang on to his fruitless messages and try to keep dividing up the body of Christ after being warned twice by the elders to not do that? A man who is sinning, verse 11. He's missing the mark. And the mark here is that You only put before the church sound teaching that contributes to godliness. And he is missing that mark, and so he is sinning in that sense, contextually. And that man is self-condemned. He's a self-condemned man. His own life speaks for itself by that point. There's no fruit in this life. This is a man who is very much like chapter 1, verse 16, they profess to know God, 
but by their deeds they deny him, being detestable and disobedient and worthless for any good deed. You see, there's nothing in this man's life that is good, even though he professes to be a, a part of the believers. No elder or any other believer needs to condemn this man at that point after a second warning because, and we're not exhorted from Scripture to ever do that, but no one would ever need to condemn him because he's condemned himself through his own factious living. And the elders at that point would know, they would know that they did the right thing. At that point, the church would have no reason to think, I I wonder if we did the right thing. We would know. We know what kind of man this is, and it is right for us to reject him. Now, that is weighty. And this text should not make one of us scared to share what it is that we're studying and reading in our Bibles. But I can imagine it might have that effect on some. I'm not opening my mouth on what I've been studying. Who, who does not have to worry about or wonder if this passage describes him? Who doesn't have to worry about that? Not the one who loves God and who loves the, the word of God. Not that one. <laughs> And not the one who is learning how to study the word better and better. And not the one who finds joy in sharing what he or she is learning in the word with others and derives great joy from hearing what other people are learning from God's word. Not that one. Not the one who loves the unity of the body and is studying the Bible and sharing it with others in that body that he or she loves. And not the one who, be, who believes that by God's strength and grace that I, they just want to become more and more godly and more and more holy. Not that one. That is not the one who is going to share something at small group that's a little off in that passage. And some elder is going to jump out in camo and issue a first warning. That's not it. That's not what's going on here. What kind of a man is this? A factious man who loves to divide, who bears no fruit from his own message and is not concerned if others stop bearing fruit as a result of his message. Who should be worried? Who's a candidate for this? And listen, we all have within us um, Unfortunately, what would make us become candidates for this kind of man? We do. And so here's what we can watch for. These are the things that would, this is probably like the first thing that would make you a candidate for it. That number one, you would be content to hear the word of God and not change. That you'd be content to interact with the word of God and it would contribute nothing toward your godly living that you would study the word, you would hear it taught, but you would not become a doer of the word. James 1, 22. To be that kind of a believer who will be before the word of God and not have it contribute towards a changed life, that's the first step towards becoming one who would then say, you know what, I like other messages that don't contribute to godly living too. I'd like to entertain those. And so we need to be a watchful people over our own lives. We need to shepherd our own hearts well that we would, every time we open the Bible, pray. Pray. Pray that God's word would have an effect on us. It's one of our core questions that we ask, right? What are you learning in the word of God and how is it producing transformation in your life or however we word it? We need to be a people who are concerned that the word of God would contribute towards a changed life. And guess what? The more we become like that, people with our Bibles open and we want to change, when somebody opens their mouth and they're talking between the lines of something from the Bible and it's just kind of, and their life looks like it might be a mess and we find nothing profitable in it for godly living, that will sound strange to us. 
And we need to step into that life and care for that person. I'm thankful that there is instruction in God's word. I hope you are thankful that there is instruction in God's word of how to care for this household that is God's. There's protection for us here. There's, there's safety for us here. There's, there's peace for us when we follow his rules. They might be hard to follow sometimes, but our unity is sweet and it needs to be protected. Now, we have um, on the last Sunday of the month, we have an open elder meeting and we're going to, elders will be available. If you have any questions about anything you've heard today, you're welcome to come to that. We also, last week, uh, Smed spent some time at our baptism service talking about um, baptism and its effects on um, larger effects in the body in regards to church discipline and, and even the Lord's table and things like that. If you would like to come spend some time with the elders in the open elder meeting, we'd love to see you and talk more about this if you have any questions. But let's pray and we'll sing again. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that... Your word speaks to almost every situation, every situation that we need to have it speak to. There are many topics under the sun in which your word does not address, but for the household of God, there is a a sure and clear instruction for us on how to live with each other and how to take care of any threats that pop up within the body of your son. Father, may we love your word more and more because we know that it leads us to you, the God of the word, and may we grow in our affections for you every time your word is open. May we never be on cruise control and just assuming that because we're Christians and our Bibles are open, well, of course, we must be growing. Lord, may we strive for growth and advancement and godliness of life and Lord, would you make us a church family that would be so tuned into that, so eager for that in a humble way, in a gracious way, that, Lord, when a message comes up that sounds off, Lord, we would, with love and patience, address it. Oh, Father, help us to create an environment where we want to hear from one another what we're studying. May we not be afraid. Help us to invite others to share what what they're learning. Help us to do it humbly as well and build one another up with your word. God, how we need you in this body. And we need one another. And we need to protect our pursuit of godliness and we need to protect our unity. Help us to do that according to your word. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.